Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where I've just learned that the England international football team, or should I say soccer team to my US listeners, are set to play their 1,000th match on, I think it's the 14th of November. Which, yes, is an impressive figure, but I did cheekily find myself thinking, is that all? I've recorded more podcasts than that. (laughs) Seriously, though, it did make me realise just how many interviews that I've recorded on this podcast. And how anybody who's just discovered the podcast for the first time can go on my site, can go on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, search for a topic, and hopefully find something of value around that topic. But then I thought, you can search for almost any content online. And our consumption of it is evolving continuously. But thousands of books containing millions of words and valuable insights are all ultimately locked inside walled gardens. Then I had this crazy thought, what if you could search through the content in a book and just pay for that information that you were looking for? Crazy idea, right? Radical. Not at all, because the team at Holloway are turning that dream into a reality. And that's led by Andy Sparks, who is a Forbes 30 under 30 founder of Mattermark, which exited in 2017, and is now the CEO and co-founder of Holloway. And Holloway is also distilling industry expertise and knowledge into comprehensive professional guides. Why? Because the internet is full of advice, ideas, but very few of it is applicable, reliable, or even relevant to 2019. That's before we get to 2020, 2021, etc., where online content quickly becomes outdated. Now, I don't want to reveal too much, so let me fly your earballs back to the US so we can find out all about Holloway. So, a massive warm welcome to the show, Andy. Can you tell the listeners a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Neil. And uh, also, thank you, uh, or congratulations on passing the 1,000 interview mark recently. Whoa, I think I saw you. that happen. <laughs> yeah, it was quite uh, a milestone, man. A 1,000. Uh, I think it's kind of strange because for weeks and weeks, I was building up to that 1,000 milestone. I think we're already at like 1,010 or 1,011. It just keeps going. So it's just in the, the rear view mirror at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about I, – I know you asked me a question about introducing myself, but that's the thing about anything creative is just – you just have to stick to it, right? Yeah. Like, it's just suddenly you have almost three years of podcast built up where it feels like you've been doing it forever. So that's that's awesome. I think you should feel really proud of that. Cool. Thank you so much. Well, so uh, you asked me just to introduce myself a little bit, a um, bit of background on me. I've been building businesses for a little bit more than a decade now. So I grew up outside of Philadelphia in the U.S., went to a big public university where I studied history three really cool things happened when I was in school. First of all, the iPhone came out the summer before I started college. I discovered business by homebrewing beer with a buddy when I was 19 and trying to start a microbrewery before we even were of legal drinking age. (laughs) And then uh, I discovered this really cool community of people that were all trying to start businesses in school together. And we all banded together and discovered everything from TechCrunch to all the major media publications and just kind of got to get an informal degree in entrepreneurship when I was in my before I would even turn 21, which was really, really cool. And so I've used that and uh, moved out to the Bay Area, San Francisco, almost eight years ago. And I'm now in my third startup. Uh, this one is called Holloway. And at Holloway, what we're doing is we're trying to build a new publishing and technology company uh, that's devoted to building a new way to read books on the internet. And uh, where we're at and what's visible online is is not the full picture, but uh, I'm excited to, to share some more and, and chat with you. Excellent. I'm really excited to get you on to talk about this as well, because like you say, Holloway launched this year with in-depth startup guides with an aim to rewrite publishing. So it's incredibly cool what you're doing here. But can you just set the scene, tell me a little bit more about the kind of problems that you set out to solve after that decade of running businesses and on, on your third startup? Yeah. So at my last company, Mattermark, we we always had these conversations, whether it was late at night over a glass of wine or something about 
what are all the questions that Google can't answer? So Mattermark was a company where we collected data on private companies and we sold it to investors. So an investor could ask Mattermark, hey, what are all the fastest growing Internet of Things companies that are in New York City that have been founded in the last three years? And Mattermark could give the list of all those companies. But if you typed in fast growing Internet of Things companies into Google, you'd get an article written by like someone from three or four years ago and you would just get a bad answer. And so we were really interested in this idea that as consumers who've gotten so trained, especially, you know, folks that are in their 20s and 30s that are just, they grew up with the internet basically attached to them, that when you go type something into Google, you should be able to get an answer, right? But yeah. the truth is actually that Google doesn't answer a lot of things. Um, and so when I left Mattermark, I spent some time researching a number of different industries, some that were totally not related to the internet at all. But I was spending time Googling and I was using my network of venture capitalists to just learn about these different fields. And what I kept finding, again, was that the stuff that showed up in Google search wasn't very useful. And I was able to get a lot better information from people. And so I went to an investor, a friend of mine, after Mattermark, and I said, hey, I think I want to spend the next 10 years of my life working on making the stuff that shows up in Google search to be more reliable. Like, how do we solve the problem that everything that shows up in Google feels like something that's written by a content marketer or a magazine? <laughs> um, and so I didn't know, I didn't initially know how, how to uh, approach that, but that was the thing that I'd, I'd been looking for something I could spend a decade working on because I think that my experience from the last decade is that it takes 10 years to really work on a problem, to understand, to wrap your head around it, to get in there, to actually start to solve it. Um, and so that's where we started. And then over time, we've evolved a lot of our thinking just by getting our hands dirty on uh, that the real problem is that the, the book publishing industry and books represent the most high quality, well-written, edited, proofread, fact-checked, consolidated knowledge that, that people and humans produce. And so why is it that that stuff is actually really hard to find on the internet? So if, you, if you've written a book, the only way to really find it online is if someone tells you about it or if you know the title of it. So if a book has 300 pages, it's got 300 pages of paragraphs inside of it. And if someone goes to Google a question that paragraph 397 that happens to be in chapter four happens to answer, it's not going to show up as a Google search result because it's copywritten and it's locked up and you can't discover it. And so that's the problem that we've really gotten excited about, which is how could you basically build a new format for books. So all of the knowledge that authors spend years of their lives working on can actually be, be discovered by everyone who's looking for answers. Wow. What a great point. And something I've not really thought about, but just listening to you talk about it now, I'm just suddenly thinking about, like you say, the vast amount of knowledge scattered across these thousands of books and millions of words that probably contain so much wisdom and answers to things that could help so many people, couldn't it? Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, we love this metaphor of before the internet, if you walked into a library, yeah. there's all these different types of knowledge products. There's, a, you know, the magazine, there's the newspaper, there's the encyclopedia, there's a biography, there's all these different types of text knowledge products. And what are all the digital equivalents of these things? So like the encyclopedia has Wikipedia, uh, dictionary, dictionary.com. <laughs> for better or for worse. Um, and for all these different media types, you see these, there's been a really, there's been a big boom of innovation. But for books, you just kind of had like Kindle. Yeah. And being able to go and buy it and download it to this very walled off environment. Um, and all the knowledge is actually very hard to get at. And so that's something that we're really excited to be spending time working on. And I'm intrigued because you were a Forbes 30 under 30, founder of Mattermark, which exited in 2017. But I'm curious to learn a little bit more about the path that actually led you to Holloway. Is there a story behind the company as well? Yeah, absolutely. Let's see uh, where to start. Um, I packed up everything that didn't fit in my Ford Focus and moved from Ohio to the Bay Area in 2012. Um, I knew like one or two people out here. I just kind of felt like if you wanted to be working on a, so a software company or an internet related startup and you wanted to move out to the Hollywood of that industry. And 
that's what I did. And a couple of friends of mine tried to start a company and we failed miserably. And by the, I think it was January of 2013, we had shut that company down. And uh, a good friend of mine, Danielle Morrill, who I had met a couple of years prior, she was the only person I knew in the Bay Area. We met at a South by Southwest one night and we, you know, had a couple of beers and talked about science fiction books forever. But we ended up living across the train tracks from each other in Mountain View when I had moved to the Bay Area. And Danielle had been working on a startup after I closed mine down. And she said, hey, why don't you just come work with, with us? We have half a million dollars left of this seed round that we raised. And we think we're going to close down the product that we're working on and try something new. And so we said, can't, you can't turn that down. This is someone that I respect immensely. And I feel like I could learn a lot from. So joined Mattermark when I was 20, or I joined the team that would become Mattermark when I was 23. And we kicked around ideas for a while. And that was a really fun company. We, we came up with the idea, shipped an initial product, talked to some customers, or talked to initial users, and then uh, asked for our first revenue, basically within three months. And then a year later, we were doing a million in annually recurring revenue. Um, and I think a year after that, we were doing something like two. Um, and then a year after that, we were doing three or four million in annually recurring revenue. So it was, a, it was a crazy journey where we went from a small team of three people to, at our peak, we were about 60 employees, all within a three and a half year window. And again, I started, we started it when I was 23. So it was just this whirlwind journey and learned so much. We also made so many mistakes. <laughs> uh, and it, it felt like I, the, the most optimistic way to look at it was I got paid pretty well to get an MBA or three MBAs worth of knowledge on how to, how to practically build a company, lead a team, and also how to not build a company and how to not lead a team. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm curious, I spoke to Chase Roberts from, I think it was Vertex Ventures last week, and he's got a very similar story where he left Ohio to go to Silicon Valley and ended up in San Francisco. You guys weren't in the same car, were you? No, we weren't. I actually, I'm not, I'm, I didn't even know Chase, but that's too funny. We'll have to make sure to, to talk. <laughs> you know, there's this, there's this funny story about, uh, it's a joke about Ohio, because yeah. more astronauts come from the state of Ohio than anywhere else in the world. Um, and so people say, what is it about your state that makes people want to leave planet Earth? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So, I mean, like you said, you've been here before, but I'm curious, what lessons did you learn from, uh, let's say, Mattermark before you decided to jump back on that startup roller coaster ride again? So the first one, I think, and probably one of the most important ones is getting the reason why you're starting a company right. And I've had to learn this lesson a couple times in different flavors, but there's a whole group of folks who are, they just know they want to start a company. Yeah. And that's in a general sense, as opposed to something very specific. So I think that I got a, a taste of not working for anybody else when I was 19 years old. And I was just addicted to never having to, to work for anyone else, probably for some good reasons and probably for some bad reasons. Getting getting your why right took me a long time. So when, when we were at, at Mattermark, my why was I want to go work for two, I want to go work for somebody who I can learn a ton from. Yeah. So I had just started a company. I had closed it down quickly after that. And I felt like I really needed to apprentice an entrepreneur who knew what they were doing. And that was the number one reason why I was at Mattermark. And so I followed Danielle and her vision and, and that was that journey. And then I decided I wanted to do something for myself. And part of the reason why was as we had gotten bigger and bigger at Mattermark, I saw that the mission of the company was essentially to help venture capitalists and salespeople be marginally more effective at their job. And meanwhile, I saw all these threads of things in the world, whether it was a climate change issue or whether it was the rise of populism or all kinds of stuff where it just feels like there's some really gnarly threatening problems in the world. And I felt like we were just making people who are already pretty well off be a little bit more well off. And that just didn't sit well with me. And so that why bled into Holloway where I said, I want to spend 10 years of my life working on something because I, I know that that's how long it's going to take to build something really meaningful. I want to work on something that I can sit back and talk with my grandkids 
about when I'm 80 and tell them, Hey, look, the world was falling apart, but at least I was in, I was in the mud trying to do something. Um, and I wanted to work on something that was aligned with the business model of actually being able to, um, to sell something to customers. So I think that that keeps you honest for whether you're creating value or not. So those are my three criteria. And I think that that was a lesson I learned over the last year, few years is just getting the why right. Yeah. Um, I'd say the next really big lesson that I learned is just about communication. When I started the company, uh, when we started Mattermark, I was so young and I just knew so little. And over the company's lifetime, we made a lot of decisions that I either didn't feel comfortable with or I didn't feel listened to on. But looking back, every instance of that had way more to do with my inability to communicate than anything else. (laughs) So just... Just learning how to listen to your own emotions and understand when you're getting angry is that, you know, what's really going on there. And I was sitting with a, a pretty young founder, so I think he's 21 or something, 22, a few months ago over lunch and just explaining to him all of that that I had learned. It was like he, he it was like was blowing his mind. <laughs> uh, so I think a lot of that you could get with any job in your 20s. I'm sure that's pretty common of people in their 20s. Is they learn they learn how to grow up and mature and communicate better. But uh, that was a really big one for me. And then the last one, I would say, uh, we did a Harvard case study, a Harvard business case study on Mattermark. And we did it when we were still running the company. And there was a decision point in the company for should we spend our Series A money on uh, doubling down on one specific vertical of customers or should we expand? And uh, it it was funny because we went back to teach the case study a year later and we still hadn't really made that decision. And so a big takeaway for me was I identify the key decision for the company that are going to really move the needle and make those decisions deliberately um, as opposed to letting the decisions stew and making them over and over and over again. Because if the company can't just get past that and say, all right, we've decided to move in this direction then you just kind of, you just kind of sit there in a decision blender and go back and forth. And that's not fun for anyone. And of course, a big part of any startup journey is raising funds and knowing when to raise the funds. But when I was researching you guys, I quickly learned that you shared the pitch deck that Holloway used to raise 4.6 million from NEA and the New York times for its how to manual business. I mean, can you share that story just for anyone that's missed it? Yeah. So let's see our, we, we did decide to share the deck. Um, and I think pitch decks are kind of a funny thing because if, if I like a lot of people are scared to share their deck because they're scared that somehow someone's going to get their idea. Yeah. But uh, if someone can build Holloway based off of the deck that we shared, then I, I invite them to do so. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so much more going on than just the ideas in there. So let's see, when we, when we pitched the company in that deck, it was, I would say if there's a lesson for any other entrepreneur, it's just, if you, the more that you can simplify your vision and your pitch, uh, the better. Uh, so that's step one. Step two of this is when we pitched Holloway, we really focused on the problem that we were solving. So when you're a small team, when you're three or four people and you're working on a big problem, a lot of people get really excited about the solution. They go right into telling everyone what their company is going to do and how it's going to be better than anything else and the impact it's going to have. But we, we really doubled down on just sharing, hey, there's a problem right now. And when you go to Google and you type in something like how to start a business, or if you type in something like how to negotiate a raise, the stuff that's showing up is so low quality. And this is how people are learning things right now. And this is why you see this whole explosion of other alternate learning methods, whether it's a Coursera or you name it, it's that people are struggling to get the right answers. And so we spent a lot of time in the pitch on that and even illustrating just how many millions of queries go into those questions and then showing the results. We literally showed you know, pages of search results to investors to show. And we pointed out, okay, here, how, how to start a business. This first link is by the Small Business Administration. This one's by an, uh, an author on entrepreneur.com. And we actually looked up that author and they've never started a business. So one of the main ways that people are learning how to start a business in the United States is by someone who hasn't started a business. <laughs> oh, that's uh, it's, it's crazy. And, the, and then you think about that problem. And so we said, 
basically there's a stopping point in every one of our pitches. It was like, do you believe that this is a big problem? And, and, and can you imagine if someone solved this, do you think that that would be valuable? <laughs> and almost, and almost everyone at that point said, yes, I'm not sure what, like how you're going to do this, but if you somehow meaningfully were able to solve that, that would be very valuable just in terms of a you know, very, in almost an abstract sense. And at that point, I think that we had most of our investors. Um, so here's the big problem. And then this is the team. This is what we've been doing uh, and why we actually have a good chance of, of making a dent in this problem. And then we moved into sharing a little bit about our vision and this is what we think that we're going to do. But when you're seed stage, I think that when you go too far into building a financial model, uh, when you go too far into trying to convince the investor that your financial model or your solution is perfect, you're almost playing this game of uh, smoke and mirrors because the truth is you're going to get six months into using that cash and building the team and you're going to learn something new about your market that's going to require you to move in a different direction. Um, and so I think that most of the, the sort of jumping through hoops that you do with investors at the early stage, um, and I don't mean that to be derogatory, I mean more that you need to prove to an investor that you can think about your problem space and the existing set of solutions and you can think about where there's weaknesses, where there's opportunities and how you can navigate all of that and, and make decisions and, and showing a financial model is useful to show that you make decisions based off of, you know, actually doing your homework on a spreadsheet and a model and not just running everything off of your gut. And so that's mostly what that deck was about for us, which was showcase the problem showcase the team, and then prove that we can make decisions with some rigor and that we've really thought about our space. And Chris Dixon from Andreessen Horowitz has this phrase called, uh, he calls it the idea maze. So every entrepreneur has to navigate the idea maze. And then once you've navigated the idea maze, you can actually know where all the opportunities are or the, the weaknesses or the, or the threats are. And so that was the last part of it was just kind of proving to investors that we'd navigated the idea maze in a way that no one else had. And something else I feel I must explore as well is, can I ask that you tell me a little bit more about how Holloway works directly with top professionals such as Brad Feld to write their professional guides that and ensure that they never go out of date? And in doing so, entrepreneurs, founders, employees can all learn the essentials of building a business from those that have never done it before. So this is really fun. So our long-term vision for Holloway is to build a new way for people to publish books, but publish and consume books online. Yeah. So I will answer your question very directly uh, right after this. So <laughs> we believe that if you were to be, if books were published in the way that we think they should be, you'd be able to read Harry Potter at Holloway.com slash Harry Potter slash Chamber of Secrets slash you know fifty seven, and that would land you on page fifty seven instead of having to go to Kindle, et cetera. Yeah. So if you could read everything on page 57 like that, then J.K. Rowling and the author could make a decision on how much they wanted to put in front of a paywall, how much they wanted to put behind a paywall. Chapters 1 through 27 could be free, and the last six chapters, maybe you have to pay to read the ending of the book. Mm -hmm. We think that that's the way that the book world should work, as opposed to just relying on reading everything on a closed ecosystem device like Kindle or just in print. So given that... The first set of uh, books or knowledge that we've decided to publish is all entirely developed in-house because we think that we need to develop uh, books in-house in order to prove to the world that this is worth doing. <laughs> it's hard to go to a publisher or an author and say, you should, you should publish your book this way, but we can't really show you or tell you how it's going to work. <laughs> so please sign over a license. And there's a very formal legal agreement for something that I can't show you. <laughs> that doesn't work. So we're publishing all of our, our you know, a first set um, ourselves. And so this first set, we decided to say, let's go with the most comprehensive, helpful, practical guides to professional subjects, like how to start a business, how to raise venture capital, how to hire and recruit engineers, how to understand and wrap your head around remote work, subjects like that. So what we do is um, in the past, we did two titles, technical recruiting and hiring, raising venture capital with um, what we called like an anchor author. We'd get one or two people to write 40 or 50% of the book. 
And then we'd pull in this whole network of experts. And so we'd say, hey, we're going out and trying to write the most comprehensive practical guide to this subject that's ever been made. <laughs> and we think that you're really smart in the subject area and we'd love to have you review it or contribute in some way. And so what we tried to do is kind of foot in the door. We'd ask someone like Brad for, hey, could you just take a look at it? Could you read this section? And then what we do is we'd share them on a Google Doc and we'd say, can you just comment as much as you want? And some people, Brad in particular, would just go through and he basically edited practically the whole thing, um, which meant that I had to go rewrite a lot of it because a lot of my opinions and takes were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's how that worked in the past. And now going forward for our, our Holloway published guides, we basically get um, an editor in-house who acts as a project manager. And that editor will develop an outline. And then from that outline, we show it to experts early on. So we make sure that we're going to have all the right subjects and topics covered. And then we use that outline once we've decided on it as kind of an assignment list. So we say, who would be the best person in the world to write this 1,500 word piece on this small slice of remote work or this small slice of you know this title? And then we can pull in 30 or 40 contributors and then our editor is responsible for stitching all those together in a cohesive manner so you can read it from top to bottom, just like you would a book. Or you could also read each section if there's just a section that's solving something very narrow for you. Um, and right now, all of the experts, it's you know people do ask us, how do you get all these people involved? And basically, we say, hey, we're not trying to sell anything here other than the knowledge itself. Yeah. You know, this isn't. We're not trying to create a HubSpot blog where we're trying to sell you know, we're writing marketing content, but we're really trying to sell HubSpot. <laughs> like, <laughs> what we're trying to do here is we're just trying to write the most helpful thing that's ever been made on the subject. And we think that if you're somebody who really cares about helping people who want to learn about the subject. Would you want to be involved? And it's a pretty high hit rate <laughs> cool. of, people, of experts that say, I'm interested in helping out an audience that, that I really care about. And as an avid online reader, I've got to admit, I'm somewhat jaded by the awful experiences by some publications. And I'm talking about Forbes is the main culprit. I don't know if you've had any problems <laughs> there. But what I noticed straight away is that Holloway's guides have no ads at all and incredibly easy to read. Was that important to you right from the outset? Absolutely, it was. When we sat down with our investors, we told them that we would uh, we'd rather turn the company into a nonprofit before we put ads on the site. Yeah. And we needed them to be on board with that. We think that advertising creates an, an, an institutionally dangerous incentive for a company. Because when you put ads on the site, you create a new customer. And the customer is the purchaser of the ads. And so the business starts to orient itself around optimizing for the advertiser as opposed to the consumer of the product, um, which you know we can see ad nauseum with the extension of a company like Facebook. Yeah. Um, and so we decided no ads because we want to build something where we're completely aligned with all of our decision-making for creating value for readers. So if people won't pay us for our titles, for our books, for our product, then that means that we haven't created enough value for them and we need to figure out how we can create more value for them. And then that's the incentive for us as a business to build ourselves around as opposed to there's a, chip, there's a quick, cheap, and easy way for us to make some money, which is throwing some ads on the site. <laughs> <laughs> so refreshing to hear as well and, and as someone that has traveled on the tech startup journey several times i'm curious what are the most are there any common myths about how to achieve startup success is there any that you'd like to lay to rest today and also is there is there anything that you'd wish you'd known before you started the first one? Oh my goodness this should probably be a novel so um, yes yeah, it's a book on its own isn't it <laughs> yeah you know, there's so many there's so yeah. many myths um i think Probably the easiest one, and I'm, I got to believe that more more than one person has answered this way, is just that it happens overnight. When I was in college, we all were so optimistic and excited about uh, the iPhone because it seemed like there were people who were 19 and 20 and 21 and 22 that were our age that were building an app and they were making all this money and getting this success immediately. And it was one of these cool fields where it felt like the world was taking young people seriously. Um, and so I would say that over the last 10 years now, though, it's shown me that while there's so no, all young people should get so excited about building a company or starting something because it's a really tangible way to be creative and 
to learn quickly on the job, but also there's so much that you learn over time. You know, the amount of knowledge to absorb as a CEO or a startup founder that you have to understand all of marketing and all of sales and all of finance. And you have to understand all of product management and project management and all these different pieces. And you just start to realize that the, the depth and the breadth of knowledge required to really understand what's going on in the business is just gargantuan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's one thing. Another, I would say I am very happy that I, I found a, a book called Mastery when I was in my mid-20s uh, by an author named Robert Green. And he really pushes the this model of apprenticeship, to, uh, apprenticing a master in order to acquire the skills that you need in order to work in a given field. And uh, that's something that I did deliberately with Danielle at Mattermark. And it's something that I've tried to share back to younger people again, which is, hey, sometimes you want to start your own thing, but sometimes you just need to go work for somebody who really understands what they're doing because that's one of the fastest ways to learn. And so it's not necessarily working for someone who's going to give you a very narrowly defined job, but going and finding someone who's really good at what they do and saying, hey, I'm not sure exactly what kind of value I can bring, but I really want to work for you and I swear I'll work hard and I swear that I will do everything I can to absorb what you know. Um, I think that that's a really cool model. And uh, I, I now kind of deliberately do that with advisors where if I need to understand marketing or I need to understand how a book comes together to go find someone who's been an expert in this field for 20 or 30 years and go spend hours with them over a couple month period just to try to absorb what it is that they know so we can integrate it into our business. And then let's see. So one other myth that I love is how hard you have to work as a business person, as, as a startup founder. I struggle with this so much. There's this Bill Walsh quote um, Bill Walsh talks about, you know, when you're awake at 2 a.m. in the morning and you haven't you haven't spoken to your spouse in a long time, and, you know, you're you're rubbing your your eyes. That's when you know that you're doing the job, and anything short of that isn't really doing the job. And everyone goes back and forth on the internet about this. You have some people like the guys at base camp that are like, you know, you only need to work 30 or 40 hours a week, and that should be enough. And there's other people that say if you want to compete in the Olympics of building a company, you need to you know, push yourself to the brink. And I think that the myth is that it's one or the other. And I think that the reality is you need to do a little bit of both. You need to have periods of balance for yourself. And you need to have periods where you sprint really hard. And only you are going to know when those things are, are which. And if you're feeling like you're falling apart and you're exhausted, you probably need to shift towards that period of working a little bit less and giving other parts of your life more attention. And if you're feeling like you're fully engaged and you love what you're working on and and, it, and this is a period where you need to just push through the next six months in order to make a big milestone happen because you know, then the only way you think you're going to be able to make that happen isn't through hiring someone else. It's just going to be by putting in some long hours. It's going to be a period where you just need to put in long hours. And so that's the last one that I'd say that I think is it's kind of an entrepreneurship myth. Sound advice indeed. And looking towards the future, though, I mean, what's next for Holloway and what is your grand vision for the company? So towards the future, today we have two titles that are live. We have one that's completely for free called uh, the Holloway Guide to Equity Compensation. We have the Holloway Guide to Raising Venture Capital. On November 19th, we publish the Holloway Guide to Technical Recruiting and Hiring. And in the spring, we'll launch our guide on remote work. Holloway will continue to develop our own content and publish our own titles like that in that same vein. But in 2020, we're going to begin a new type of publishing, which is basically trying to work with up and coming authors uh, to do sort of a new line of, of, of publishing that we're called, we're calling publishing on Holloway versus publishing by Holloway. So if we can take one author who's got a manuscript that's pretty much finished and they're looking for a new way to distribute it, uh, using what we've built. We want to start working with more authors in that way. So um, 2019 was a year where we worked with a ton of different contributors and we do these very comprehensive guides. We're going to continue to do a few of those. But what we want to start with in 2020 is to work with single authors who want to publish on Holloway and we're using the technology that we've built so you can publish across all these different pages. Um, so it'll be kind of the beginning of that. And then hopefully in 2021, 2022, we can start to work with existing authors and bigger names and publishers and start to license content and distribute it so more people can find it. Uh, so hopefully five years from now, 
when you go Google how to start a business, you find some really great book length content from professional entrepreneurs and business people who have built businesses and people are learning from those folks uh, using content that's published on Holloway as opposed to just learning from stuff that's scattered all over the place or, um, or, you know, just written by somebody who doesn't necessarily have the experience that the person's looking for. Wow. What a huge step forward and a huge achievement that will be as well. And for people listening that want to find out more information, find you online, have a little look around or even contact your team. If you have any questions, can you just point them in the right direction on the best way of doing that? Yeah, absolutely. So for me personally, I'm on Twitter way more than I probably should be. <laughs> um, I'm at SparksZilla, which is S-P-A-R-K-S-Z-I-L-L-A. And my DMs are open. That's the easiest way to reach me. A lot better than email. Um, as, a, as for the team, as for Holloway, if you're interested in writing with us or publishing with us or editing with us or anything with us, uh, you can just email us at hello at holloway.com. Fantastic. And like you say that the internet is so full of advice and ideas, but, but if so few of it is applicable, reliable, or even relevant to 2019, never mind 2020, 2021. So I, I cannot thank you enough for what you're creating here and for actually coming on and sharing that story with me. So the best to look for the future. I will get you on next year as well, and we'll stay in touch and see how that journey's going. But more than anything, just a big thank you for joining me today. Thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Neil. This was fun. I say at the end of every episode that technology works best when it brings people together. But Andy is quite literally using technology to improve people's lives by simply making it easier to learn from the best on their own schedule. So before I go, will you be checking out Holloway? What did you think of the concept? And do you have anything to add to today's conversation? Please email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com, tweet me at Neil C. Hughes, and pop by my website, techblogwriter.co.uk, where you'll find links to all the other podcasts out there. There's a long list of episodes. And if you need any help with business blogs or launching your own podcast in 2020, give me a shout, and maybe, just maybe, I can help you there too. But more than anything, I just want to hear your insights about what you heard, about everything that you heard today, because I'm sure you're going to have some something valuable that you can add to the conversation. But it's time for me to go now. I will be back tomorrow. We've already got a guest lined up. So the only thing I'm waiting on is if you're going to turn up and be here too. So hopefully you'll come and join me. We'll do it all again with a with a different tale of how technology is transforming an industry or indeed our world. So a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.